Um, I want to welcome all of you this afternoon and tell you that we're very glad to have you here. Thank you for attending. We, the Russell Library staff and I, are very happy to host this special event, A Persistent Past, Reckoning with Racial History in the Era of Obama, a lecture by Pulitzer Prize winning author Douglas Blackman. We're going to have a reception and book signing follow. There will also be a question and answer period, and we have a special surprise during that time, and Jill Severn on our staff will be conducting the question and answer, and she'll tell you more about that. For those of you who are not familiar with the Russell Library or have not been to our events before, I encourage you to look at the back of your program to know more about us. This has really been an auspicious day for us. Um, not only are we hosting this premier program, but along with our colleagues in the Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library and the Brown Media Archives and Peabody Awards Collection, we celebrated the groundbreaking uh, this afternoon for our new special collections building. Uh, it's really quite an exciting day for us. Uh, after so many years of fundraising, I think we could say perhaps as many as 15 years of fundraising. Uh, so we're really glad to get to this point and we're looking forward to 18 or 24 months from now when we can actually move. And then we'll have the pleasure of having programs like this in our own home and we can welcome you there. So that's a great thing to look forward to on this campus. Today's lecture is programming that's associated with two exhibits that are currently on display at the Russell Library. One is Measuring Deliberate Speed, Georgians Facing School Desegregation. And the second is With All Deliberate Speed, the Associated Press in Little Rock. On May the 17th, 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a decision in the case of Brown versus the Board of, Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, putting an end to legal segregation in public schools. In the years that followed, school desegregation took center stage in the media, as well as in the hearts and minds of the citizens across the country. Measuring deliberate speed, Georgian space school desegregation, is the culmination of a year of research and planning by Russell Library staff. The exhibit was created to showcase materials that illuminate the tactics, rhetoric, and reactions of Georgians to federal school desegregation mandates. With all deliberate speed, which was created by the Associated Press Corporate Archives, um, serves as a companion exhibit that explores how the news agency prepared for and covered Little Rock and its reverberations throughout the uh, South. The AP had never had a more difficult test for its mission to serve all people equally with objective, timely reporting than it did in covering the desegregation of Little Rock. As other programming that's associated with these exhibits, we are now hosting lunchtime, lunchtime screenings of five documentary films that explore the impact of school desegregation in the United States. These short films are drawn from the collection of the Walter J. Brown Media Archives and Peabody Awards collection. They examine different perspectives, and they range in creation date from 1961 to 2007. Each screening begins with an introduction from the Peabody Awards uh, archivist, Mary Miller, and it concludes with an informal discussion about the topics that are addressed. This series takes place each Friday from 12 to 1 in the Russell Library, and then we'll have a final screening um, on the evening of February the 25th from 7 to 9 p.m., and this Friday, we actually have the second film in the series. So if you've not been over yet, I hope you will come and take time also to see the exhibit while you're there. Today, I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the following units of the University of Georgia. Of course, the University of Georgia Libraries, our parent institution, the Civil Rights Digital Library, the Department of History, the, institution, the Institute of American, African American Studies, and the Office of Institutional Diversity. I want to give special thanks to the University Library's Development Office, Debbie Dove and Chantel Dunham, who have helped significantly organizing and arranging for this event on a day that they had to do quite a bit of work for the groundbreaking ceremony as well. Their support and our co-sponsors have given us the opportunity to give this occasion the fanfare that it deserves and to provide an enjoyable and educational afternoon uh, for you. I also want to recognize especially Russell Library staff, Jill Severn and Jan Levinson. I know Jill's in the doorway back there. Where's Jan hiding? <laughs> She's hiding also. Uh, they are the masterminds behind our exhibits and our related programming.
Both are extremely talented and we appreciate them, and I want to repeat that. Both are extremely talented and we appreciate them. <laughs> and uh, you're seeing our name more and more on campus because of the work that they do. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Douglas Blackman. For more in-depth uh, description of his work, I refer you to the inside of your program. Mr. Blackman is the Atlanta Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal and a Pulitzer Prize winning author, as I've said previously. Over the past 20 years, he has written extensively about the American quandary of race, and especially the dilemma of how a contemporary society should grapple with a troubled past. Many of his stories in the Wall Street Journal have explored the interplay of wealth, corporate conduct, and racial segregation. In a 2001 article, Blackman revealed how U.S. Steel Corporation relied on forced black laborers in Alabama coal mines in the early 20th century. The article led to his first book, Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black People in America from the Civil War until war through or to World War II. It broadly examines how a form of new slavery or indentured, or rather involuntary servitude, uh, thrived in the U.S. long after legal abolition. For this book, he won the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. Interestingly, he chose to dig into the topic using the same focus that journalists and scholars had used to shed light on forced Jewish labor during um, the World War II and in Germany. He pursued legal records, oral interviews, business and municipal records, family and personal memoirs, to piece together a comprehensive history of exploitation of African Americans by whites in the years following the Civil War up until the 1940s. And this is a period that he calls neo-slavery. This painstaking research into a wide variety of records exposed an extensive system of laws and intimidation that resulted in the virtual re-enslavement of tens of thousands of African Americans during that period. For this work and for his um, especially his uh, research. He won the 2009 Georgia Historical Records Advisory Board Award for Excellence in Research Using the Holdings of an Archives. And of course, being the director of an archives, we're very excited to hear uh, someone win such an award and also to know how well they have used um, primary sources. Blackman continues to research and write about this period of neo-slavery and its consequences are connections to the politics and economics that still shape contemporary American history and society. And these connections, as well as his work as a journalist and his experience as a Southerner, he was raised in Mississippi, will certainly inform his lecture today, a persistent path past reckoning uh, with the racial history in the era of Obama. Douglas Blackman, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Appreciate all of you coming out. Congratulations too, to, uh, to, to all of you, particularly those of you involved in the other events going on today. That's exciting news about the groundbreaking of the new building. Um, and particular thanks to Jill Severn and Chantal Dunham, who, for, through whose efforts this day began to be planned uh, after Chantal and I met at the Savannah Book Festival almost exactly a year ago. Uh, so it's great to be here uh, and, to, and to be among folks who appreciate both the, the topic and the importance of the topic, I think, and hope, um, uh, but also the way, that, the way that it was obtained, the way that, uh, that I got to some of the story. And I will put in a plug for archivists and archives, uh, they, uh, and, and not just the big, well-funded ones uh, uh, that in the state capitals of the South, but I really did in the course of the the eight years that I worked on this book, uh, I was astonished at uh, how important uh, little bitty archives and things that lots of uh, lots of researchers maybe would have passed by uh, in, in past times and genealogical repositories done by amateurs in all sorts of places that that in fact uh, proved to be incredibly valuable in trying to reestablish the humanity and identity of people who at the time were not viewed as very important or, or completely inconsequential. Um, and so I found again and again and again that the, that the archivist mind uh, was incredibly important to my ability to, to accomplish what, uh, what I was trying to do in the pursuit of the book. But uh, I'll also uh, say, I'll also confess, as I do whenever I go into an academic setting, uh, that I do it with some trepidation. Uh, since I'm not an academic, uh, 
and, uh, and not really a trained historian, uh, but a journalist primarily, uh, with an English degree from a little liberal arts college in Conway, Arkansas. So whenever I go into the halls of academia, I, I worry a tiny bit, uh, not, not just from leftover neurosis from my undergraduate days, but I worry that someone in the room who spent more time than me, even more than my eight years, on some aspect of the whole thing will spot a loose strand of thread and start tugging on it and that my tapestry will unravel immediately before you. Um, but so far that has not happened, uh, as I've talked about the book. But, it, uh, but it's good to be here and among people who have looked at these topics and who have, in fact, spent more time than me on certain aspects of some of this and to engage in this kind of dialogue and this kind of a setting uh, with people who recognize the importance of it. But what I'd like to do today uh, with this group, and this is sort of my third, my, my third presentation here at UGA today, uh, so I'm hoping, for those of you who've stuck with me all the way through, I'm, I'm, I feel not stalked, but flattered. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there are a few of you here. Uh, and uh, it's, it's actually been a wonderful afternoon of, uh, of talking to very interesting people, students, faculty, and just interested folk uh, who have who've come into some of these things. And I hope I haven't already said everything that I have to say, um, but if I'm repetitive for any of you, I forgive me for that in advance. But what I'd like to do uh, is talk a little bit about what is the book, though you've just heard a pretty good description of it, uh, but I probably should talk some about that, maybe read something short from it, uh, because I have come to grips over the past year and a half with a harsh reality that every author must come to grips with, and that is that not all of you have yet completed my book. Uh, I realize that. And uh, so I'll try to give you uh, uh, a concise idea of what the book is really about. Uh, and then something about why I wrote it uh, and a little bit about how I pursued it, uh, though we just finished a session that was mostly about that, so I'll go light on that. But then get to the real point of it, which is the topic that you may see in your program, of, uh, and that really is what does this matter? Uh, in fact, what does any history matter? What does, what does racial history matter at all now? Uh, and which is, I suspect, in the in the atmosphere of, of this group, that may sound like sort of a preposterous question or a ridiculous question. But in reality, uh, it's a it's a very formidable question that has to be reckoned with, and particularly the idea that in in a time when we have just accomplished such an extraordinary thing as a society, in the election of an African American president no matter what your political views are. Uh, what an astonishing development that is. Uh, and in an era such as that, you know, is it time to stop talking about some of these ugly things from the past? Uh, what, do we, what do we do with the, th the new revelations that come along about the past? And, and what do they really matter uh, in an era when, so, when we know so much has already been accomplished? And those are not questions we can dismiss as easily as, as some of us might be inclined to. And so I'll, I'll try to get a little bit to, to that question as well. But first, what is slavery by another name? In essence, it's the, the story of how, a, a very historical story for the most part, of how after the Civil War, uh, the freed slaves, four million of them, and the first generation of their descendants immediately after the war, lived in a period of authentic freedom and authentic citizenship, a very difficult time, period of great hardship economically and in terms of access to education and government services, and, uh, but, a, but a time that was also extraordinarily difficult for, uh, for a very large number of very poor whites in the South at the same time. And, but that this period that lasted 15 or 20 or 25 years, depending on where in the South one is talking about, uh, but this period of authentic freedom in Reconstruction and then even after Reconstruction, in which uh, freed slaves and their descendants voted and held elective office at, at times, and, but participated as citizens in at least some kind of authentic way, uh, and experienced, even under hardship, uh, some of the fruits of freedom, of real freedom. But then, beginning in the 1880s and accelerating in the 1890s, how this terrible shadow began to fall across black life in a way that removed that freedom and removed those those aspects of real citizenship from the lives of almost all African Americans in the rural Deep South, and how the critical element of, of that process, I argue, was the reimposition of a kind of slavery. Uh, and that that happened in different ways, in different places, uh, but that fundamental to, to that process uh, 
was how in every southern state uh, how laws were passed by the state legislatures to effectively criminalize black life, to create a kind of legal jeopardy which existed around almost every African American man at all times, made it almost impossible for a black man not to be vulnerable to the possibility of arrest at almost any time and under any circumstances unless he lived under the explicit protection of a white man. And that the passage of these laws in all of the southern states created this jeopardy, which essentially removed the whole notion of justice and the law and the legal system from the lives of African Americans and became both uh, a, a, an incredibly powerful economic mechanism for forcing blacks back into a kind of coerced labor, uh, an almost free labor system uh, for, for white landowners and in particular white industrialists uh, who were who were aggressively expanding coal mining and timber operations and all manner of other uh, 19th century industrial activity um, um, at, the, at the turn of the century. So this became a mechanism for supplying these armies of black laborers uh, in slave-like conditions to, to, to white capitalists and at the same time and simultaneously uh, was the most powerful weapon for the destruction of black aspiration and the removal of black political rights and citizenship and freedom. And I would argue that that, that process and, and, that, um, and the terror that was engendered by those developments, this terror which sank, which began to grind into the daily lives of almost every African American in the rural South, that that became a more powerful instrument for the subjection of almost all African Americans in the Deep South than did the more common expectations and, and expecta explanations and expectations of racial violence uh, that, that most of us in our sort of cinematic version of this history that we've downloaded from film and, and elsewhere, this idea that the Ku Klux Klan and, uh, and the, the, those sorts of vivid visual images of how blacks were oppressed, in reality that was less a factor than this grinding economic uh, reinstitution of slavery, which became pervasive all across the South and particularly in Alabama and Georgia. Now the book is, is built tells that story, how, that, how those things happen, and then tries to tell something of how that system as a mass mechanism affecting millions of people finally began to break down in the 1940s, and hence the, the subtitle ending with from, from the Civil War to World War II. Uh, that's not to say that every aspect of what I write about in the book ended with World War II. Uh, many, many people uh, will, in fact, it's likely that in the Q&A today someone will will ask about this or tell us a, an anecdote, I've, I've heard scores of them, uh, of how there were people who continued to live in a state of de facto slavery into the, into the 1950s and into the 1960s, and there were prosecutions for involuntary servitude deep into the 1960s and even the 1970s, I think. But the, uh, but the book really tells the story of how, as a mass mechanism, a mass institution in the South, um, how this happened and how it began to recede from the lives of black Americans in the 1940s. <coughs> Narratively, the book is built around a single family of slaves, a group of African Americans, or Africans, however one would say it in that context, uh, who were held as slaves on a farm in middle Alabama by a white family named Cottingham. Uh, and it begins with the story of an African-born man whose name in slavery was Scipio. Uh, and he became the patriarch of a great family of slaves during the slavery years, and then he lived to the end of the Civil War, uh, and then experienced that period of freedom after the war, and broke away from the Cottinghams along with many of, many of his descendants uh, during the slavery period. And the, the book follows the story of how the Cottinghams, as the African Americans called themselves in various spellings, but how the Cottinghams uh, continued to hold on to freedom and hold on to their, their citizenship and their separation and dominance by whites, uh, how they persevered through that, even as this terrible, these terrible forces began to close on them in the 1880s, and sort of their narrow escape from destruction at various points in time. But how ultimately a young man named Green Cottenham is born to former slaves in the 1880s, and who then rises to adulthood by the turn of the century, just as this terrible, terrible new system is metastasizing all across the southern landscape. He is swept up in that as a 22-year-old man and is arrested uh, outside a train station in Columbiana, Alabama in 1908, uh, sold into a coal mine owned by a subsidiary of U.S. Steel Corporation, and five months later 
Uh, he dies there on August 15, 1908, um, in, under terrible, terrible circumstances in a, in a horrifying uh, forced labor coal mine. Uh, I mentioned a, a group earlier today that that date, August 15th, also uh, coincidentally was also the, the same date that in Springfield, Illinois, on August 15, 1908, uh, a mob of whites uh, enraged by uh, a false claim of rape by a white woman against a black man, uh, a, man a woman who had actually been having an extramarital affair with a black man and then was discovered and then made a false claim that she'd been raped by the man. Uh, a white mob uh, became enraged over this uh, and, and became particularly enraged when the black man was spirited out of the Springfield jail and taken to another city to prevent his lynching. Uh, and so the mob uh, turned furious and then rampaged for two days through the home, through the what had become the hometown of, of Abraham Lincoln, uh, and what was at that time the blackest city in the Midwest, a place that had been a great magnet for black early black migration out of the South. Uh, and this white mob rampaged through Springfield, burned all of the black neighborhoods of the city, attempted to expel all African Americans from from the town, and before it was over, murdered uh, an elderly black man, broke into his home, dragged him out of the house slit his throat in front of his wife and children and then hung him from a tree in the front yard. And then after he died, chopped down the tree and cut it into little pieces and distributed the pieces as souvenirs. Well, that man, that black man, was, a, uh, was, the, was the wealthiest black citizen of Springfield at the time, but he had started off as a cobbler, a shoemaker uh, in the 19th century and had made boots for Abraham Lincoln, who was one, probably one of the last African-Americans alive um, who knew, Afri who actually had met and knew Abraham Lincoln. And so he's murdered in the course of that rampage. Now that's a coincidence that Green Cottenham died on that date and that those events occurred in Springfield at the same time. But for me, it underscores the degree to which that by the beginning of the 20th century, the degree to which all white Americans across the board, even though, even though we, we, uh, we typically orient ourselves to the more heroic stories of, of individuals who stood against these forces, but in terms of the great consensus of white Americans all across the country, north and south, by the first decade of the 20th century, there is no meaningful constituency left in defense of citizenship for African Americans. Um, there is a belief that it was a good thing to have ended slavery, to, to have ended chattel, the old antebellum slavery, but there is a widespread view that it was a terrible mistake to have afforded real citizenship and voting rights to African Americans. Um, and so this is a, the, the nadir of black life, and it was described as such by Du Bois and many others at, at the time. But so the book, the book follows that story of the Cottenham family and, and, and other stories as well, and tells a story that is primarily in Alabama, though it also has a big section in Georgia that talks about um, principally how, uh, how the, really the fathers of modern Atlanta, the, the, the uh, capitalists and sort of corporate leaders of Atlanta in the 1890s and the first years of of the 20th century, how their fortunes were deeply rooted in these practices in slave mines and coal mines and brick making factories and timber camps all over Georgia. Georgia by 1900 had dozens and dozens of forced labor camps all over the state. Um, this particular area where we are now um, at the beginning of the century still had very large plantations relatively nearby. Uh, where there was extensive use of, of forced, labor, forced black labor by some of the most powerful people in the state. Uh, and in Atlanta, the two primary uh, characters in all of that were Joel Hurt uh, and, uh, and then, the, and then a, for, a former mayor of the city, uh, Captain James English, who had been the mayor of Atlanta in the 1880s and was really sort of the political boss of Atlanta from the 1880s through the 1920s. And those two men, Hurt and English, uh, were not just the architects of modern Atlanta, but they were extensive users of thousands and thousands of these forced laborers who they acquired out of the criminal justice system in Georgia, both through the state courts and the county courts, which were a sort of frontier of kangaroo justice uh, at the time. They acquired thousands and thousands of black men, forced them to work under these horrifying circumstances with these incredibly high mortality rates all over the state, and then the fortunes that were derived from that work poured into other enterprises, which are very much a part of our lives today. And none of this is to cast aspersions on those enterprises as they exist today. But Joel Hart, for instance, founded Trust Company Bank in the 1890s, which then, which is today SunTrust. Uh, at 
he then brought to Atlanta uh, his brother-in-law, who was Ernest Woodruff. Uh, and Ernest Woodruff became the president of, of Trust Company Bank, and then in 1919 organized the initial public offering for the modern Coca-Cola company. His son, Bob Woodruff, was the longtime president of Coca-Cola. Um, the uh, Hurt also founded the first streetcar company in Atlanta, which became the first electric company, which became Georgia Power and, and hence Southern Company. Uh, the, the Captain English, the former mayor, had a giant brick-making concern on the outskirts of the city called Chattahoochee Brick. In fact, the introduction of the book is titled The Bricks We Stand On. And in effect, the Chattahoochee Brick made the vast majority of the tens of millions of bricks that were used to build Atlanta, literally, at the beginning of the century. I live in a 1906 house in downtown Atlanta that almost certainly the chimneys and the footings of the house all came from Chattahoochee Brick, and the, the sidewalks and the streets of my neighborhood are underneath the pavement, uh, almost certainly are lined with Chattahoochee Brick. The City Council of Atlanta bought millions and millions of bricks from Chattahoochee Brick, all of it made by slave laborers uh, in the employ of Captain English. Captain English also started a bank that became First National Bank of Atlanta, that became Wachovia Bank, which the now late departed Wachovia Bank. Uh, and so, so these were men who, and, and Hurt as well, in particular, uh, Hurt was a kind of, uh, you know, he, he became somewhat famous. He built the tallest building in Atlanta, what was the tallest building in Atlanta until modern times, the very elegant Hurt building, which still stands in downtown Atlanta. There's a Hurt Park that honors him. Uh, and he was a real estate developer who developed some of the most beautiful neighborhoods of Atlanta, Druid Hills and Inman Park and those places close to downtown. Uh, and he built the homes in his neighborhoods for many of the wealthiest families of Atlanta. And that's what he's primarily remembered for uh, from that period of time. But Hurt was also a fairly diabolical guy. You know, there's really no, the, the historical record is fairly clear in his own words when he describes the, uh, these, these forced labor camps that he controlled and that his son managed some of them. They, these were places of unspeakable torture and horror where men worked, starved for months at a time, received no health care, were beaten to the very limits of, of their lives to force labor out of them. Their bodies were dumped in mass graves when they died in the mines. Um, there was a almost sadistic quality to some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the record of what happened in some of these places. And so th there was more going on than just a sort of accidental um, following of the momentum of, of southern, uh, southern racism somehow. These were, these were fairly di diabolical men in many cases. And, and these are things which we connect to in the present. And that's a big, a big point of the book, is to try to explore this question of, of what, what are the connections of the present to the past. And I contend in the book uh, that these events, and particularly the reality that there are thousands of African Americans who are alive today, retire in retirement, elderly African Americans, who in fact were born into a state of de facto slavery somewhere on a farm in South Georgia or somewhere in Alabama. Uh, and in, as I've gone around the country talking about the book over the past year and a half, I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me and said, okay, now I finally understand the story that my grandmother used to tell or that my grandmother said my great-grandmother used to tell about the farm in South Georgia where they couldn't leave, uh, the white man wouldn't let them leave, and they never got paid, and they couldn't get off the farm until her brother came back after World War II and snuck them away in the middle of the night. I didn't believe that story when I used to hear it, and I would say, I'd say, Mama, that was the 1930s, that was the 1940s, slavery was over by then, and so then she just stopped telling the story. I mean, I, I, I have heard versions of that story just over and over and over again since the book came out. And, and for me, what all of that tells us is that when we look at the, the persistent gap between the educational attainment and the wealth achievement of, of African Americans and whites in America today, this idea that that is rooted in slavery, in old antebellum slavery, and that somehow the poverty and lack of education of slaves and of ex-slaves in 1865, that that's the reason why there's this gap, just doesn't hold any logical water uh, and in fact, these events of the 1920s and 30s and up to the 1940s are really the explanation for, far more so the explanation for why things are the way they are today. So that's the, that's the now you don't need to read it or buy it, you know, you know what the book says. Uh, 
You can still buy it. It looks good on the shelf. Um, the, uh, now, I'm often asked, uh, I'm so often asked this question, um, a certain question. Uh, in fact, I know there's someone in the audience now who's already formulated this question uh, and is planning to ask it. So I'm going to go ahead and short circuit um, and, uh, and ask the question myself and then answer it. But it usually goes something like this. Why would a white guy who works for, uh, who, who, who comes from the Mississippi Delta and who works for Rupert Murdoch <laughs> at the most conservative newspaper in America uh, write this book? Now there are a lot of things going on in that question, including something of a misperception of the Wall Street Journal and what the Wall Street Journal is about, but it's still a reasonable question. Uh, and, the, and the answer to it is a little bit complicated, but um, I'll give you a version of it, and that is that uh, I was born in the Mississippi Delta in the fall of 1964, and a few months after Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney were murdered in another part of Mississippi. Uh, in 1965, there was a farm labor strike on a plantation on the outskirts of the town where I lived in the Delta. Uh, it was supposed to have been a, a huge strike involving all of the big plantations of the Delta and thousands of African-American laborers and their families. But on the day, the appointed day of the strike, May 31st, I think, um, the, only this one group on this one plantation went through. The others had been intim intimidated, communications had broken down, and this one group went through with it. And they'd all been organized to, around all of this by the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and there were some SNCC activists still there from Freedom uh, summer, uh, and, and so this one group of strikers just outside my town walked off the plantation. And they were evicted from their homes. Uh, the men in that group never were able to work again in the county. Uh, there are one or two of them still alive. The leader of that group just died a few months ago. All of those men never worked again. Even after they could have worked, they were really under the belief that they couldn't work in the county anymore. Um, so that's 1965. Then in 1968, uh, a group of black high school workers marched from the black high school across town to the white high school to protest a, a silent march across town to protest the continued segregation of the schools, uh, even though the Brown decision had been 14 years earlier. And when they arrived at the white campus, they were tear gassed by the redneck police chief in the town. And a melee ensued, uh, and fights broke out on street corners, and people were running around town for the, for the next day, and windows were being broken downtown. And at some point, uh, a 16-year-old black boy uh, burst through the door, front door of a feed and seed store on the edge of town, and the white man behind the counter pulled out a pistol and shot him in the doorway. Uh, the boy survived, uh, but there was never an investigation into the shooting. The man who did the shooting was never prosecuted. Uh, the town didn't calm down again until, uh, until the governor sent in state police a day later. Uh, then in 1969, October of 1969, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a sweeping order that's not much remembered now, but was actually an incredibly important case, uh, but, but issued this order directing 30 school districts in Mississippi, including mine, uh, to immediately integrate, to cease all resistance uh, and immediately integrate at Christmas of 1969. And so the schools closed as segregated schools and then reopened after Christmas, integrated in every grade. And it was the end of the freedom of choice plan and all of those evasionary efforts of the late 60s. I then began the first grade in the fall of 1970. And so I was in the first class of children in Mississippi to begin the first day of first grade together, black and white, and go through 12 grades of public education together. Now for a variety of complicated reasons, in my town in the Mississippi Delta, there was a little cluster of white families that stuck with the public school system. That was very unusual. Uh, most of the towns in the Delta, all whites, immediately abandoned the public schools and never came back. Um, but in my town, uh, things happened a little differently because of some reasonably good leadership um, that was partly inspired and partly not so inspired, but for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I ended up going to schools that were about 75% black, 25% white. Now, through my childhood in those early years, uh, I, of course, didn't know any of those events. You know, obviously, I wasn't aware of the farm labor strike when I was one, and, or the, the, the student, the high school uh, march when I was three, four, and those sorts of things. Um, but I did know, even in the first grade, that something was very wrong. You know, something was very, very wrong. Uh, all the black kids were mad at me for some reason. I could not put my finger on uh, so I was kind of mad back at them, even though I didn't exactly know why I was mad back at them. 
Uh, also, there was a strange thing of that I went to this very black, very integrated school, but all the rest of life was still completely segregated. I played and I went, had an all-white Boy Scout troop, even though our Boy Scout hut was in the black section of town, it was an, an all-white Boy Scout troop. Uh, I went to an all-white swimming pool, I went to an all-white church, I played on an all-white Little League team. You know, every aspect of life was still as segregated as ever, even as I went to this very conflicted and confusing integrated school. And so really early on, for whatever reason, uh, I was compelled to try to understand what was going on, why this was the case, and what exactly was this all about. And so I started asking a lot of questions, um, which even then were not terribly welcome most of the time, uh, but I kept asking questions. And then uh, finally, when I was in the seventh grade, that's sort of when all of this really started, um, was in the seventh grade, there was a, the uh, County Historical Society had an essay contest it was, I believe, the sesquicentennial of the county. Anybody, what exactly is sesquicentennial? I don't remember. What is sesquicentennial? What is it? 75? 150? What is that? 150. 150, okay, it's 150 hours. I should know that by now. Um, but the, uh, it was open to any student at any school in the county on any topic of Washington County history. And so for reasons I don't remember anymore, I wrote an essay about that farm labor strike in 1965. Uh, I really don't know how I even knew about that event because it was not something that white people would have spoken of. Uh, and so it must have been that there were children of the strikers who, went, who I went to school with. Because one thing I left out was that after those families were evicted from their homes on the plantation, they moved to first to a piece of property owned by a, a black man who had a little country store and then later to another piece of property purchased secretly by a a white philanthropist who was financing a lot of the civil rights movement heard about the plight of this group of families and she bought a piece of land nearby uh, and the strikers and their families moved there and first had a tent encampment and then later built houses there uh, and that place came to be known as Strike City. And there were children of Strike City who were in that class, that first integrated class with me. And so that must be how I even knew the place existed, but I'm not certain. But so I wrote this essay. I even went out and uh, talked to the plantation owner who was still alive at the time. I did not, as would be customary for a white person in that time, and even today, I suspect, uh, I, uh, I did not talk to any of the black people who had been involved in the strike. I only talked to the white people. Uh, but I talked to the plantation owner. I tried to, I went back through all the newspaper stories, tried to understand it, and I wrote this essay, um, a sweet, sweet little seventh graders essay. Uh, about the bravery of the strikers and how they survived the attacks of the Ku Klux Klan and, and how, uh, how good things came of it all. Uh, and I submitted my, my essay, and a few weeks later, a letter came back, a typed letter with my name on it, unusual event for a 12-year-old in 1976. Um, and I opened it up, and it was a letter from the Historical Society saying I had won second place in the contest, and I should be at the county fair on a certain day, a certain place, and Mrs. Baker would be there at a certain place in a blue dress. Uh, and, uh, I should go there for, to, to get my certificate. And so my mother dropped me off on the appointed day, and I went to the appointed place, and there was a white lady in a blue dress, obviously Mrs. Baker. Uh, but I was too timid to walk up and say who I was. And I thought, well, if that's really her, she'll see me and figure out that I must be Doug Blackman. And so I stood there waiting to be recognized. And she looked at me several times and then looked right past me and looked around and there had been no, no hint of recognition. So I began to doubt whether that was Mrs. Baker. Uh, and then finally, after a long while, another little white boy came walking up who she immediately recognized. And I knew who this kid was. He went to one of the SAG academies that had sprung up um, at the same time that I was starting school. But I knew him through church circles. Uh, and they immediately began conversing about the essay contest. And so I knew, okay, that's her. And I, I bolstered my, my spirits and I walked up and said who I was. And I don't know if it was in that instant or later that it dawned on me, but somehow in the expression of Mrs. Baker when she looked at me, I realized that the combination of the oddity of my name, the fact that I came from a black school, the topic of my essay, I was supposed to have been the little colored boy getting a certificate that day. <laughs> so I've always considered myself an early beneficiary of affirmative action. <laughs> but not, that line always gets a laugh. Um, but the, um, the following year, 
I converted my essay into a speech uh, that I gave in the Lions Club oratorical contest. Um, and I won the junior high school competition and then went to the finals of the competition, which was at one of the weekly meetings of the Lions Club where two finalists from the high school would be there. And so I went on the, the Thursday of the finals and uh, we all gave our speeches. And uh, the other two were very uplifting uh, speeches about the next generation and the leadership of America and all that. And then I gave my speech about Strike City. And uh, immediately, again, I knew something was wrong uh, as soon as I started giving the speech. Uh, because this group of you know, 30 or 40 middle-aged white men uh, were, were, were sort of snickering at places that, you know, that were serious um, and, uh, and didn't seem to react to the places that were sort of the swelling emotional part about the survival of the, of the strikers and, and all of that. And of course, it, it was odd to me because from my mind at that time, uh, this was, even though the events had occurred just 10 or 12 years earlier, uh, to me, this was just ancient, ancient, dead history. You know, I, I even somehow had it in my mind that even though I had interviewed the plantation owner, that somehow everyone involved with that event must be dead, even though I met some of them. I mean, it just seemed so ancient to me that uh, I couldn't imagine that this was something that anyone actually still actively cared about or, or carried any trauma about. Of course, it also had not occurred to me that that I was giving my speech to the Ku Klux Klansmen who had attacked the strikers in 1965, but in fact, I was. Uh, and so uh, I did not win the contest. <laughs> As you might imagine. Uh, but uh, at the end of the, of, of, the, of the meeting, after we'd all given our speeches, we stood there and everyone filed by very politely in the receiving line uh, as one does those events. Uh, and it was all just fine uh, until one last man came up, waited, stood back, and came, came to me. And, and uh, the way I remember it, he was about eight feet tall and 100 years old and had crazy shock of white hair all over the place. Uh, in reality, he probably looked a lot like I look right now. <laughs> but he came up to me and he attacked me verbally, just began to berate me. Where did you get all that, boy? You know, that's, those were all lies. Who told you those things? Nothing like that happened. Who's been telling you all this stuff? And uh, I was mostly just perplexed. You know, this was just more strange adult behavior. You know, at least that's the way I remember it, uh, was that I was not terribly traumatized, but just confused. So at first I was trying to answer his questions. I went, well, you know, talk to someone, so all that. But he kept going and just fulminating. And it got so, uh, so loud at some point that my teacher, Sort of my sponsor through all of this uh, wedged herself between the two of us and kind of pressed, pushed the guy away and, and then finally he stopped and scuttled out of the building. One thing I, what I didn't know at the time was that there had actually been this epic battle going on uh, at, in the lead up to the day that I gave the speech that it involved the school superintendent and the principal and my teacher and the mayor of the town, this whole debate about whether I was going to be allowed to give this communist influenced speech to the Lions Club. Uh, but I didn't know any of that for another 20 years. Uh, but, the, um, but so the guy finally you know, shoveled out the door and then a few weeks later or a few days later another letter arrives with my name on it. I open it up and it's this incredibly formal apology from the, uh, from the president of the Lions Club uh, about you know, the incident that had occurred the previous Thursday. And again, I was just completely mystified. I did not, none of that made any sense to me. Uh, but I did notice that after that, there was never again a Lions Club oratorical contest in, in the town. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was the end of, uh, of that whole enterprise. Um, many years later, about 20 years later actually, uh, when I, I got ready to, um, uh, after my high school class uh, on the 10th anniversary, the graduation of that class, uh, by then, I, it, I had learned, sort of accidentally figured out that we were that inaugural class of black kids and white kids together. I had never known that in my childhood, <clears throat> but as an adult, I had stumbled across that that was the case. Um, and so I wrote an essay uh, in the, in the, on that 10th anniversary of the graduation of that group uh, about what had happened, and I went back and did some research into those events, tried to figure out the things that had been going on that I didn't know about as a kid. And that's when I pieced together most of what I've just told you. 
Um, and that essay ended up running in first the Atlanta Constitution and then Harper's Magazine in 1992, I think. Um, but in the course of all that, I discovered that the man who berated me that day after I gave the speech was the same man who shot the 16-year-old boy in 1968. Uh, but so I wrote, wrote about all that, and after it was published in Harper's, the mayor of the town, the man who had been the mayor through almost all of my childhood, wrote a letter to the editor that was published that said that no one in my hometown could remember any of those events having ever occurred. None of them. Complete denial. And so, so I've always had this very sharp sense that there are many things that we as Americans would simply prefer not to remember and that we will go to great lengths not to remember. That frankly, it is understandable how hard we try to not remember some of these things. But I have a very sharp sense of that. But I also have this incredibly sharp sense of why we must. And that's really the topic, you know, the, the, of the, the ostensible topic of my, my remarks of you know, this persistent past. By, by the persistent past, what I mean is a past that simply will not go away. As hard as we might hope to forget, or as poor a job we may do in remembering, the past simply will not go away. It always comes back. In fact, more and more of it keeps coming back. Uh, that is inevitable. But so then this question of what do we do with that, this, the inevitable persistent past, what, what, what should we do with it, uh, particularly as it pertains to these terrible events related to race, what do we do with that history at a time now when the nation has pulled off this extraordinary thing of electing a black president. No matter what any of our political persuasions may be, uh, it's an absolutely astonishing thing and certainly the most, the single most tangible demonstration of how much progress has been made and how, how much good has been done, even though there is by no means is everything exactly as it should be, but we have achieved this extraordinary thing. And so there are many these voices in society now that that have said from the very beginning, not, not just in the last few months uh, as things have gotten more complicated, but there have been these voices from the very beginning that have said, okay, it's time now to abandon all of that. Stop talking about all of those things. I had this fascinating conversation with, with the Rusks here earlier today about, about their efforts on uh, memorializing the, the murder at, at Moore's Ford. Uh, and this question that they are wrestling with of just how hard do we work to remember these things and to, to what, what are the consequences of all of this going to be. And the, particularly in the age of Obama and particularly when there are these voices that also say it is time for African Americans in particular to abandon what some call it, Juan Williams of NPR called it the the narrative of victimization, I'm sure others talk about that too, but this idea that African Americans have defined themselves with a narrative of victimization and that it is time to abandon that, as proven by the election of President Obama. Those are potent questions. You really can't dismiss them, even, even, even to those of us to whom it may seem dismissible. We can't. Those are reasonable questions at a certain level. But, but they're wrong. You know, the implication of them is wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. And the reason for that, and the reason for the book, is not, to, is not to remember these things or dredge these things back up, uh, to, to lay a giant burden of guilt on the backs of every white American. It's not to put a new weapon in the hands of, of aggrieved African Americans with which they can uh, express their anger or have another reason to pursue slavery reparations or some other some, uh, some, some other thing that they or a politician might want to pursue. It's not about those things, or at least for me, it's not about those things. Uh, what it is about is, and this may sound a tad bit kumbaya-ish, um, but, but I'm sincere about it, that for us to understand both how we got to where we are and why certain things are still necessary and important in our society, for us to understand those things, like affirmative action, for instance, again, ignoring that there may be political differences on this, uh, but for us to have any sort of meaningful discussion about whether our society should continue to offer some sort of remedy, some sort of, some sort of effort, some mechanical effort to try to close the gap 
between blacks and whites in economic and educational achievement. If we're going to have a serious discussion about that, it cannot be serious unless we are brutally honest about exactly how we got to the place that we're in today. And none of this is to say that there haven't been thousands of other scholars and historians and writers who have contributed to that discussion already. But I do think that the events that I write about in the book and that others have written about in other ways, but perhaps never quite so never quite articulated it in exactly the way that I do, uh, I do think that this is an absolutely critical part of understanding where we are now and how we got here. And if we ever want to engage in honest, good faith conversations about what the future should be and what a shared vision of American life should be, then we have to come to the table, black and white, honest about what has happened and how we got here. I think it's also incredibly important that, that we remember that those of us who know some part of this story, either having lived it or having studied it, uh, that in the nature of, of the human condition, we, we tend to go away, we tend to disappear. Uh, and so it's a fallacy for any society to ever believe that just because some aspect of these things has been revealed at some point in the past and been discussed at that time, that there's, a, there's any sort of ability to stop talking about it then. Uh, and I think the people in this room who are in the business of, of educating brilliant young minds would, would agree with that and would talk about that, you know, that we actually have an extraordinary opportunity right now in the clean slates of young minds that are manifesting themselves in universities and other places everywhere who both are incredibly ignorant, black and white, incredibly ignorant of so much of what happened, even the most obvious parts of it, but who are also magically somewhat ignorant of the demons that, that led to all of this. Uh, and so there is an opportunity to, to talk about these things in a way that educates and edifies our society and strengthens us against some of these kinds of ideas ever perpetuating themselves across the American landscape again. So that's the story of slavery by another name. I guess one last thing I'll do on this topic of why we should remember. I'll read to you an email that I got not long after the book was published. Uh, and you'll remember the character I told you about a few minutes ago named Joel Hurt. But this email actually came to me from a high school teacher. Uh, and it used to be when I would read this, it used to be I didn't need glasses, but now I do. Uh, but the uh, when I first got the, the first couple of times I read this to any sort of a group, uh, I read the woman's name, and then I realized that she might not want me to be reading her name uh, in connection with the letter. And so I stopped, I deleted it, uh, and now I don't remember her name anymore. But, uh, but this is her email. Dear Mr. Blackman, I am the great-great-granddaughter of Joel Hurt, the Atlanta capitalist I described earlier. I've only just discovered your book. I found everything possible about it on the web, including this fascinating website. I'm trying to muster the courage to read your book. Just reading excerpts has been quite painful. Needless to say, this is a very emotional subject for all of us, as we did not know any of this before. But in the meantime, I'm writing because I want to thank you, simply for having written it. I have had that same photo of great-great-grandfather hanging on my wall for years, and have always been proud of his participation in rebuilding Atlanta after the Civil War. But I believe that the ghosts of slavery and racism and the terrorism inflicted within our own country must not be hidden away, but brought out into the open. I'm so grateful to you for allowing me to learn more of the truth of my family's past. Without the whole truth, we live only in illusions, and I would hate to live my life perpetuating illusions especially such horrific ones whose ramifications continue today. I remain proud of where I come from, but humbled by the realities that you brought to light. So I thank that reader, and I thank all of you for listening this afternoon. I'm happy to do... Yeah. Happy to do to take questions or questions. comments I'm or you, personal attacks. Our money's worth that, Mr. Blackman. <laughs> <laughs> He's been talking what, since he got What money? Money? <laughs> <laughs> it's money. Sir.
Well, and that's a and that's a hard question, uh, and you know, complicated, and it probably varies from you know instance to instance, all sorts of variables in in that question. I'm fascinated by it too. Right. Yours is an unusual situation, though. I, I have a kind of easy response that doesn't really answer your question, uh, but the but the easy response, though, it, like so many aspects of this, frankly, um, are that in the vast majority of instances of these. Of, of what I would say are episodes from the past that need to be revealed or need to be remembered. In the vast majority of them, we're nowhere near where you are. You know, the, the, the mass grave that Green Cottenham's body was almost certainly tossed into on the outskirts of Birmingham and the even larger, this vast mass grave at the bottom of the hill from, from, the col from down from where his body was dumped. The, remain, the, the remnants of the Coke ovens nearby where apparently many, many, many African-American forced laborers' bodies were burned after they died rather than taking the time to dig a hole and put them, put them in the ground. All of those are places on the outskirts of, of Birmingham that today, un, unless I take you there and one or two other people who have done some work on it, nobody even knows that that place exists much less that there's a marker or a trail or, you know, or a piece of paper to pick up at the historical society to tell you what happened there. And so, it, it, and again, this, this isn't really answering your question, but, but the, I do think that in, we are still faced with so much of this past, which has barely begun to be acknowledged at all. And so I always have, kind of, usually when I'm asked, how do we, re, what should we do? How do we remember this? Usually I get to have a very easy answer, which says, says, gee, a plaque out at, the, at, out at the Pratt Mine Cemetery might be a good start, you know, a nice simple start to just acknowledge that this happened, which is essentially what you did and, uh, and the other folks working with you 10 years ago. Now, it's true that once you move down that path and there begin to be people with different ideas of how things ought to be remembered, uh, it gets more and more complicated and it takes a lot of, of good faith and nobility uh, of the soul, you know, to sort through those things. And I imagine that it's complicated. Uh, in the case of this specific thing, I'm not, I'm not certain. I do know, as we talked a little bit about at lunch, that one of the problems with talking about our racial history in particular uh, in America is that we get very tired of it really fast. You know, e even when something, even when a revelation is made, I mean, it's one reason why I think that and um, to some degree, my book is a, it's not really intended as a shot across the bow of conventional American history of the 20th century, but in some respects it is. And, and I have some beefs with a lot of, uh, of, of the conventional treatment of some of this. But, but one of the reasons that I think, uh, even in the classic scholarship of this period of time, 
there's been a tendency to minimize the severity and the degree of some of these injuries to African Americans and the scale of what happened. There's been this tendency to go with the interpretation of events that is, that is defensible, but the least objectionable. I think there is some tendency of that um, over time. And, and there's a tendency to do something like that in the memory and the memorialization of these events is because living with the raw, the most raw, the most terrible version of things, which may be the most truthful version of things, is so uncomfortable. And even people who are open to that discomfort for a little while get tired of that discomfort after a while. So the annual, you know, the, the sharp, bracing annual memorialization of that event becomes very difficult for a lot of people. Does that mean it shouldn't happen? Uh, I'm, I'm honestly not certain. Uh, the, uh, you know, or is there some, some place in between. You know, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that, that prompts from me the, that most escapist simpleton answer of uh, it, it demands a kind of visionary leadership that, that I wish would show itself up, um, uh, and that, but that, made, that I don't know exactly what it would look like. Uh, but, I, but the fact that you and others are wrestling with them, with those issues and trying to figure that out is among the most uh, the most commendable and redeeming things that somebody like me can hear about anywhere, because the vast majority of these kinds of incidents are not are not receiving any kind of due from anybody. How's that for a non-answer? Uh, <laughs> Let's go over here first. He had his hand up, and then we'll go back to you. In the uh, in the era of Obama that we're in today, and you being uh, your generation being the first to go through in class to where it was totally integrated. Do you think we're a generation away, two generations away, where the white supremacists of the world are gone and we have equality uh, between the races? I mean, we are, you know, the, the white men that are in charge today won't even equalize for women. Uh, they don't get paid what men do. Right. Uh, we haven't been able to change that. You know, what is it going to take to change the equality of the races? Well, one thing is we're all getting a lot browner. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I think that trend is going to continue. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, in fact, uh, I sometimes I say it teasingly, but I'm actually serious about it, that um, in terms of, uh, you know, when we talk about the Holocaust and why, why the Holocaust should be remembered and, and, and and there are, uh, it's always dangerous to bring up the issue of the Holocaust in any setting whatsoever, uh, discussing something else. But, uh, but there are a lot of very instructive lessons about memory and how to remember, how to remember the past, why to remember the past. Uh, and the Holocaust, because it's something that we all generally agree about, um, is actually, we agree about how terrible it was, and we generally agree about the facts of what happened. Uh, and so how we have learned to remember it and talk about it is instructive about, about some of these issues. But um, the, 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 the most repetitive thing, of course, about why we remember the Holocaust is so that it would never happen again. Uh, that, that's the, the most common refrain. And when we talk about these things in American life, if the reason we need to remember them is so, so they would never happen again, that's a, that's a laudable reason, uh, obviously, so that it would never happen again. But I would also remind all of us that if it does happen again sometime in the future, it's almost certainly to happen to the minority at that time. And that minority is likely not, you know, to be white people, not, you know, not brown or black people. And so white people have a real vested interest in making sure that this never happens again. <laughs> it will probably happen to us. Um, but the, but the, you know, this question of when will, when will we get there? You know, who knows when we'll get there? Um, I also, though, uh, I mean, maybe, you know, certainly we, things are progressing more rapidly. Even though I've written this incredibly grim book, and for those of you who have not read it, it's really grim. It really is. Uh, I can't tell you how many people have also, you know, emailed me and said, you know, thank you for writing the book. I can only read two pages at a time. That's why it's taken two years. But, um, but it, it's a grim story. There's no doubt about that. Um, but the, um, yeah, I've lost my. I've lost, I've lost my tangent there, um, but the, uh, but in terms of when will this, when will we get to this, this next place, uh, whether it's a generation from now, whether it's two generations from now, uh, 
even though I've written this very grim book, I'm still very optimistic. I'm an optimistic person about these things. I, I, I see such a fantastic degree of progress that has happened in the last 40 years, and I think we continue to progress, and I think that you know, the election of President Obama, and again, no matter whether you like him or you don't, you know, that's a, it's an exhilarating thing that, uh, that our nation has pulled that off, and we need to, you know, all of us need to be able to relish that, even those who don't like it, you know, you need, need to be able to recognize the good things that that signals about the society that we live in. Uh, when this will all be taken care of, I'm, I'm not sure. Will it ever all be taken care of? I'm not sure. Um, but are we making progress there? Yes, I think we are. Uh, and how do we keep doing it? How do we keep accelerating that? Well, I think by being honest about what happened so that we can be even better at making progress than we have been in the past. Uh, and I do think that, um, while I'm not here to make a political pitch of any particular type, and that's a bad thing for a journalist to do on anything, I do marvel at the way, marvel is too positive a word, whatever the <coughs> negative version of marvel is, um, uh, but I, I verb that um, about the way that that so many people are so troubled by things like affirmative action, like the kind of affirmative action light that, you know, that has occurred in America over the last 25 years in particular, because it's through those kinds of mechanisms which in reality have harmed and inhibited almost no one. You know, I, I keep trying to find this white guy who lost his job because of affirmative action. I have yet to meet him. Uh, or this, this student whose life, this white student whose life goals were thwarted because some black person got to go to the college that he wanted to go to. I have found a lot of people who failed the firefighter test, um, uh, and, uh, but was, were convinced that the reason they didn't get to be a firefighter was because of affirmative action, not because they failed the test. <laughs> Those people are easy to find. Um, but, uh, but I do marvel at at this attitude in the country, uh, oftentimes, that says these incredibly innocuous things, which harm almost no one, but which have been so instrumental to the progress that's been made over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, it baffles me that there, that there is a desire to stop or undo those things when, when the evidence is overwhelming of the good that it does for our society. And if we can stick to some of those things, then we'll get to some version of that place. First an observation, I think uh, Mr. Murdoch's probably very happy with you at the Wall Street Journal. I don't think he'll be plucking you for Fox TV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, except perhaps as a target. <laughs> um, secondly, uh, what did your story lead you uh, to? What are you working on now? What's the, the big story you uncovered in your earlier work? Needs to be told. Well, there, uh, there. I have two big projects in addition to my day job uh, right now. Uh, one of which is a documentary film that's being produced based on the book, uh, which is a really exciting, uh, uh, exciting project uh, that's being produced by the public television affiliate in Minnesota, and directed by a really brilliant uh, African American filmmaker named Sam Pollard, who's based out of New York, and is, um, he's he produced, he directed the. Um, Spike Lee's Katrina film when the levees broke, and he was very involved in Eyes on the Prize. And so I'm incredibly lucky that I have ended up working with these uh, amazingly creative and, uh, individuals on this documentary film, which we will have gotten some, very recently gotten some funding for from the Kellogg Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and, uh, uh, and so we'll start shooting that this summer, and, uh, and then hopefully that will be on, on PBS in the fall of 2011. So, so watch for that. Uh, so I'm spending a lot of time on that. But I am also writing uh, another book that it's really, I'm, I'm returning to a book that I wrote before this, uh, before I began work on this, and uh, which is a strange experience because it's a memoir of that period of time that I was describing in the town that I grew up in, those events. And so I wrote about a 250 page manuscript uh, about all of that more than a decade ago uh, that's never been published. And so I'm now returning to that. And so it's kind of like going back and reading someone else's diary, sort of, uh, written 10 years ago, and, uh, and, and reapproaching that. Um, uh, and so hopefully that will be out sometime in the next year or two. And I've recently changed my role at the Wall Street Journal. I now have the title, as of just the past couple of weeks, of Senior National Correspondent. So I'm going back to more of a writing role and, and more periodic editing. And so 
I had a story about Tiger Woods on page one just a couple of days ago. Um, uh, so uh, a variety of things. I think we've got time for about two questions, so we'll go here and then. Um, I, I was wondering if you're familiar with, um, you, you talk about the, the whole institutionalization of slavery after the Civil War. If um, I recently came across um, people who are trying to change uh, laws regarding prison farms, like say in Angola, and how that is actually a current modern day uh, form of the institutionalization of slavery with, of course, the majority of the people being there being African American males. I was wondering if you've heard anything about that or what you feel about people trying to change the laws to outlaw prison farms. Sure, and, the, and all the, the whole prison, and the, the southern version of, of uh, the prison farm phenomenon is very related back to these events. And, uh, and to my amazement, I felt kind of stupid about it when, it, uh, when a year or so ago this thing came up in, uh, in Alabama where a sheriff was actually indicted for doing a lot of the things that are in the book. that <laughs> It was indicted for doing them in the last few years um, of, uh, that involved, and, and I realized as a result of that, that the legal structure that permitted the sheriffs in 1905 and 1925 to, to be in this business of where the economic incentives for them were to arrest as many people as possible and feed them as little as possible while they're in the county jail, which is a diabolical combination. Um, that the laws that set up that structure are still on the books. And, and this guy was indicted, thank goodness he was indicted, um, uh, recently for these gross abuses and, and for fraud within all that. And so there are all of these, this surprising number of vestiges of, of the old system and the old structures that, that linger. Uh, and the prison farms are part of that, and Parchman Farm in Mississippi is an example of that. And Angola obviously is, a, is still a pretty terrible place. I don't have a lot of specific knowledge about about it right now. I also am often asked about uh, about the current sort of debate over the pri private prison uh, industry, prison industrial complex, and also often hear from people about the idea that well, isn't the mass incarceration of African American men today uh, essentially the same thing or an extension of all this? And so all of those things are those are all reasonable questions and reasonable inquiries, and there are connections between all of those things and what I write about in the book. However, they are different. You know, they're, they're different in important ways, I mean, and one of which, of course, is just the, the level of brutality and violence and just the, the, the astonishing magnitude of the venality that was at play so openly and with the endorsement of all of Southern society and most of Northern society. Uh, it, the, the sort of staggering weight of all of that uh, is thankfully not a part of, of, of what we see today. But these events are, in my view, how America became conditioned to the idea that it is normal and natural and almost inevitable that a huge percentage of the black male population is going to be under the state's control at all times. Uh, and that the conditions under which they are forced to live their lives while incarcer incarcerated uh, don't necessarily have to be very humane. You know, this is, this is the explanation for how it came to pass that white people didn't find that to be particularly bothersome or outrageous. Uh, but, but exactly what should be done now to address those things, uh, I fall back on the same answer I had before, that in some respects a, a more brilliant mind than mine uh, will hopefully come up with a better solution than I have. Okay, well, oh, one last question yeah. over here. Forced labor primarily in the South or only in the South? Overwhelmingly in the South. They're really only in the South. And it was really only in those parts of the South where there were a lot of black people. You know, that, you know, so, you know this was uh, uh, so Southern states that had smaller black populations and, you know, for, and the, but so where this happened on a massive scale were in the black belt counties of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina. You know, the, the counties that had the most dense slave populations in 1860 are the counties that had the most dense uh, uh, occurrence of, of these events. And so the racial nature of all this is overwhelming. Though that is not to say that there were whites, that there were not whites who had things like this happen to them as well. There was a percent, a varying percentage of whites uh, who were pulled into the system. And this was the penal process of the southern states in that time. And so particularly if you committed a felony, uh, white or black, you were going to end up in some circumstance like this, but over and over and over again, uh, whites were treated, even very, even in these forced labor camps, whites were treated radically differently than blacks, oftentimes uh, 
Um, and it was very commonly the case that in the most terrible places, the most terrible forced labor camps, uh, would invariably be 90 and 95 percent black. And where the mortality rates were 30 or 40 percent a year, those it was almost always black. So this was a black, so, a southern phenomenon perpetuated against blacks overwhelmingly. Okay, how about a round of applause?